potentially very dramatic disintegration event. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Jenny. Oh. We will stay with fluid flow problems uh, at a little bit different um, setting, though. Um, and our, because our next speaker is uh, Robert Weiss from Virginia Tech. Um, he works on tsunamis, been coming to the CCTMS meeting um, several times in a row. So, like, we're excited to have him as a keynote speaker and um, show us some of his work that he does at Virginia. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank you, organizers, for inviting me. Uh, give a presentation. Uh, we're gonna uh, talk about uh, very different things now than uh, we just saw. Uh, it will be so brutally simple that you might uh, hardly out of the room. Um, but before we start, I uh, would like to give you a little overview of what we're gonna talk about. Uh, we're gonna talk a little, I'm gonna express uh, a few thoughts about um, hazard modeling, hazard to tsunamis and also to comment on a few things that I've heard during the last few days. Um, oh, I can't. Then um, uh, I would like to tell you a little bit about the difference between tsunamis and storms because that's a discussion we have to have when we talk about tsunami hazards. Some modeling approaches uh, for boulders and sand is a prominent uh, sort of tsunami deposit. So I, I heard a lot this saying that all models are wrong and uh, but some are useful and actually I think that's not really right as it pertains to the modeling that we do. This is, this is something that uh, uh, comes out of statistics where we have maybe a random process that we don't know uh, what it does necessarily uh, and uh, sort of blurring that picture. But with our type of modeling, we usually have a good idea what the physics are because the physical processes that guide us, they're very principal physics, like for example, gravity works downwards, this kind of thing. And then uh, regarding this, we know where the target is. We just may not hit it really well. We may not have numerical method that 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 are very that are very um, uh, precise, but and, but we know where the target is. So that's a difference. So and also in in terms of data, that's the same thing. We know how the data should look like, but maybe it doesn't. And so we need to think about that a little more as we move forward. Uh, what I'd like to uh, uh, say about models is, or my understanding of models is related to Mona Lisa, which is a model in itself because it's a picture of a woman. Let's assume that woman is real. And then you can look up the internet and you can find all sorts of algorithms, quote unquote algorithms, that tell you how to draw a Mona Lisa. And if you're really good at that, you have a good model. So you learn how to, to draw the Mona Lisa. I mean, I draw it, it's still like this, but the but the thing is, I learned something. I learned something about the process, and I learned something about the governing processes that, that resulted into this picture, even though mine is not as good. But I can do 70 million of this in a day, whereas this can be only once in a lifetime. You know? And then we have to discuss the difference between sort of uh, deterministic modeling versus stochastic modeling. And, and that's sort of like the transition that I go through right now in my research, where I go from deterministic modeling to stochastic modeling, uh, sort of losing some of the accuracy or precision and hope that uh, with, with picking the right distribution of, uh, around the parameter uh, or parameter space uh, to actually depict Mona Lisa on average. Uh, the other thing is that I've been thinking about a lot is model coupling. And that is probably the essence of, of, uh, of uh, CSTMS as I understand it over the past few years. And I have a little child uh, that, that is growing up and what I noticed is that in the, in the past, when they were when they're playing together, let's say a child builds a block, the next child, model one builds a block, model child two takes the block, takes it apart and builds another block. And that's the same sometimes what we do with model coupling. So let's say we use a three-dimensional model to calculate the velocity, but we only need a, a three-dimensional velocity, we only need a two-dimensional velocity in the next model. So we take that all, average it out and then give it over. But that doesn't mean we, we can leverage or we, uh, or we use the advantages of a 3D model of the first model and the second model. It's sort of blind coupling, it's parallel play, if you will. But then something really, really astonishing happens at the age of three, three and a half. Uh, when all of a sudden the child takes a block and 
does something with it to improve it or gives it another purpose, another uh, sort of insight. And that's sometimes we have to, uh, and we have to do exactly that when we think about model coupling. We not only have to mo a couple models just because they get an information, I think we also need to a couple models with each other that are appropriate to couple. And then uh, the, uh, the sum of them is credit and the parts. So that's the goal in my mind. And that's also the transition that I'm in right now, even though I'm uh, not a young PhD student anymore, but some things take me a lot longer than others. And then there was a lot of um, talk about data, uh, model data integration. And that's really an important thing, especially for tsunami science, such a data-driven science. Both of them have a lot of uncertainty. So ideally what we have, we have a model, let's say of the ocean or the earth, and then we have a function f that are the governing equation that generate the data that we then uh, sort of see as a model output. Uh, so the M is the model data. Then if you compare that to, uh, to data that we measure, uh, so the F would be uh, the field data, it's sort of approximately right. But what we often forget is that actually the data is a model too. We have to assume certain things of the data. So then there's, a, there's something we need to understand. We need to be honest about it both is both is uh, uh, exposed to uncertainty. So, and definitely what is true is rubbish in is equal rubbish out. So you cannot expect just because you have a good model that your result will be good if the data that you compare it to is bad and the other way around. So we need to be honest about our errors and uncertainties on the data. And obviously we have to be honest and, uh, and aware of the uncertainty and errors of the model. Right, now we're going to the real stuff. So tsunamis, tsunami hazard from deposits. So if you look at the earth, um, there are lots of areas where tsunamis can strike, but there are also a lot of areas where storm can strike. So they are, they are both agents of, of traumatic coastal change and impact as traumatic. Um, the biggest uh, sort of financially, the, the most devastating disasters are, are related to these two processes globally, uh, loss of life, what, and, and you name it. The problem is, well, it's fortunately and unfortunately, depending on what side you are, none of these processes, storms and tsunami, occur frequently enough that we can use the, uh, the, the, the measured record as a way to project future impact. So we have to go into, into the geological past and we have to interrogate the geological record. And that is a problem because it's not just a real measurement, it's we have to invert what is saved in deposits about the cause of the process. Uh, but before we even start doing that, we need to understand the major differences between, between storms and tsunamis. This is a 2004 tsunami. It's just the, uh, the, uh, the positive uh, wave uh, as, as a tight gauge measurement. Um, I think it was from the Indian Ocean tsunami, somewhere in the Indian Ocean, close to Africa, I think. You see the waves, uh, there are a few waves dominating the Anyway, just imagine where the six hour is. There are a few waves dominating the system and we see a very um, um, stark dec uh, dec uh, uh, decrease towards uh, 60 hours. So it's, it's just a few first waves dominate uh, tsunami ha the tsunami hazard. That means tsunami sediment transport and destruction. And if you look at the storm, it's a, it's a very different the situation you have, uh, you have a buildup of the storm surge and the waves, and then it goes down. So that's the wave height, or wave amplitude. If you look at the periods, they are vastly different in terms of, in terms of uh, uh, how they act. So now imagine you are a sediment grain that is exposed to, uh, to a storm or a tsunami. Uh, you need to think about how many waves does a tsunami have? Let's say, uh, let's say four or five are important. Guess how many waves are important to uh, erode a sand grain of like two millimeter? How many waves do you think could, could erode that sand grain or move that sand grain in a regular storm, an average storm? Is it hundreds? Who's for hundreds? Who do you think 100 waves? How about 1,000? Let's go orders of magnitude. 10,000, 100,000. Well, there were so many people here that didn't actually answer, so maybe. Uh, it's 33,000 waves. So, and, and you can imagine that the deposits that are generated were potentially 30,000 pulses can generate a, or can 
you can cause sediment transfer would look different than uh, from those that, gener that are generated by one or two pools. So here's the question, which one is the tsunami deposit? Okay, so first, who is for the right one? This one. So who thinks the right one is the tsunami deposit? Uh, sorry, so uh, yeah, it's for you left. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> this, this is so. This is your left, right? My right. Sorry. This is the one. So who's for the other one? Wow, brave souls. They're both tsunami deposits, and that's a. <laughs> and I could and I could show you the same for storm deposits. You would not be able to distinguish them. And so everybody who can, everybody who says they they can distinguish tsunami from storm deposits is really confident in a very wrong way because of you can't you really can't and that's where the context is important and that's where we really need to study how these sediments are formed and i believe that and i've and i've come to the conclusion that uh, with deterministic modeling where i thought if we know how the precise physics is of a tsunami and then look at how precisely sediment is moved we can not only explain the top layer which is the 2004 tsunamis, but all of these other bright layers underneath. And I no longer think that's possible. I think we need to look into other ways that are much more statistical uh, to do that. And I think that's an important transition uh, that is going through the tsunami community right now. It's the acknowledgement and the beginning quantification of uncertainties around deposits. And that's, and I'm talking about the generation processes. I'm not talking about the, uh, the processes that take place after the, after the tsunami was deposited and soil is on top of it, what we call the post-depositional post -depositional processes, they alter tsunami deposits as well. So this is a hugely complex problem that, that I'm afraid that we will not necessarily solve uh, uh, soon. And when, we talk to, when we talk about tsunami deposits, you know, we all know about sands, but we also talk about something like that. And uh, the yellow, uh, the height of the yellow and, uh, and the height of the, of the white is one meter. So that's, uh, you know, I don't want to be near that thing when that moves. But that's also transported by a tsunami. And that tells us something about the cause of process as well. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, the, uh, the motion of both, both of these uh, deposits. Let's talk about boulders first. So boulders are anything that's above 25 centimeter. And so it's a wide range of possible, possible grain size. We did a little study. <coughs> and when I say we, I mean mostly my students. Uh, we did a little study with a three-dimensional um, uh, hydrodynamic code called GPU-SPH. And we, and we coupled it with an, uh, one of these gaming engines uh, that, you know, do very fancy particle motions. And it's really it's physically very accurate. And, so we decided to look into that and expose the boulders that we place in this experiment, this, this experimental uh, sort of setup, um, and different water depth, different sizes, and so forth. So we create a little parameter study to see. And then we said, uh, let's do a little scaling analysis to, to maybe see a difference between boulders that are moved during tsunamis and those uh, boulders moved by storms. So we did that uh, parameter study. It's very limited because of the runtime of the model is about a week and so you need to you know you need to uh, sort of plan ahead of these things and just, unfortunately the size is not very large of parameters there. here's some snapshots and you can really see very complex motions how boulders sliding and roll and it's really really cool but then if you analyze the data in a sort of uh, a systematic way and just sort of look at the geometry of the parameter space that you just just, just created we were assuming that we could see a sort of simple parameter space, a geometry, in the sense that we could discriminate between boulders moved by tsunamis and storms. But that is not the case. So you can see they're all together and they form a really, really complex parameter space. Uh, and that was the first hint for me that physically speaking, we may not be able to see a difference or we, we may not be able to discriminate between them. And I thought, well, that's great. It's a really nice complex model, but I want to use a more simple model. And that's what I did. So I assumed a spherical boulder, which is as uh, realistic as a spherical cow, uh, place it on a slope, put some roughness in front of it, and then assume that the boulder is, uh, is lodged 
when it reaches this critical uh, sort of, or, or passes the critical angle. angle. Uh, this uh, sort of uh, simple approach has been done many times in, uh, uh, there are models around uh, that, uh, that um, do similar things, but they just assume that the sum of the forces is larger than zero, and then they can see that the boulder is this large, but I argue that's not the case. If the boulder doesn't reach this Lotman angle, then the, the boulder will move back in this original position, and we will talk about it in a second. So it has to reach that dislodgement position uh, to, uh, uh, to get, so that we know that the boulder is actually uh, dislodged. So we use, we use the most simple equation that there is, Newton's second law of motion. Uh, we do some, uh, um, you know, the, the sum of the forces is very standard way. We have to just assume uh, the, uh, the term uh, in the first equation with the seven fifth is because of the iron water and we have to displace water. There's some issues there. But in a sense, it's a very cheap equation. It's very simple, nothing fancy. But it has a fundamental uh, sort of change how we think about recognizing border dislodgement. So that's a starting point. And as you can see here, it has to overcome this little step before we can recognize that it's dislodged. At the moment, the sum of the forces is less than zero, so the boulder doesn't move. At some point, the forces start, and the boulder starts moving. So what would happen if the boulder, if the forces would stop now? The boulder would move back into its original position, and we would not be able to recognize that the boulder moved. And we can continue this until about here, and now the boulder can dislodge, and now we can recognize in the field that the boulder actually has, has moved. Compared to previous models, uh, we uh, that just use the threshold of uh, the 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 uh, sum of forces larger than zero as a as a as an indication of motion, we introduce a thirty to seventy percent error in the estimate of the wave height. That's not good, and the, and this not so uh, fortunate thing is that we cannot predict which one it is. It's thirty or seventy. It depends on a lot of uh, components. But the good thing is now is as you notice, this takes some time for the boulder to uh, to move up there. So maybe we can use this as a way to discriminate between storms and tsunamis because we're not only linked to the, uh, to the maximum amplitude, but also to a timing. And we know that boulder uh, periods, of, uh, sorry, storm wave periods are in orders of magnitude smaller than tsunami periods. So was the thought. I was very happy about it. I was like, yeah, cool, let's move on. So we also, I also thought that back in the day, we used to do a lot of like, monochromatic sine wave sort of assumption for storm and tsunami waves is again as realistic as a spherical cow and it's not really functional. So I start using uh, uh, sort of nonlinear waves and used uh, frequency domain models. So you can see here that uh, instead of using one wave uh, to describe a, a storm wave, we use many, many, many waves and perturbations. And we used, uh, we used the triads equation, a very simple slope, we placed the boulder there and then uh, uh, we uh, <coughs> simulated uh, the wave evolution as we go ashore with this frequency domain um, uh, model. So what we see here is in the uh, in the upper portions, A, B, and C are different water depths. The left one, right one is 20 meters, uh, and then to five meters. And as you can see, this, the spectrum changes significantly on the left on the left side of the boulder, and that's what we call the the infragravity domain. So infragravity domain means longer waves. So as the, as, the bo as the waves moves ashore, more and more energy, wave energy, is pushed into the longer wave, uh, components of the, of the waves. That's important for boulder transfer. If you look at the uh, uh, resulting uh, sort of time series, you see that um, in, in greater water depth, they're very uh, asymmetric, uh, sorry, very symmetric, and they're not a lot of spikes. But if you go to the shore, uh, the, uh, the wave signal becomes asymmetric. The, the, uh, the crests are higher than the troughs, and there are more spikes because of wave-wave interaction. That could lead to boulder, tra could lead to boulder transfer. And exactly, that's, that's taking place. For these th different realizations of the same spectrum, we can sometimes, uh, we, can, uh, we can see that not always the same boulder mass is, is, uh, is um, uh, dislodged uh, due to the non interactions between the different wave components. So we see, for example, that for a really a small, um, really small wave, uh, sorry, mass for like, let's say 255 kilogram, um, uh, 
yeah, for uh, fifty uh, for two hundred fifty five, almost all of the realizations uh, dislodge of over, and as we move towards um, seven point five tons, less and less and less realizations are able to move. So that's great. So we generate sort of a dislodgement frequency, and if you plot that up uh, over your entire spectrum, and this is about eighty million model runs that are in there. You can see generally it's pretty nice. You can see that larger boulders need larger waves to move uh, to move um, where to dislodge the boulder. We also see that there's a there is a uh, uh, it sometimes takes um, a larger um, mass area to move from blue to red, and red meaning all of the boulders are dislodged, and blue meaning no boulders are dislodged for this situation. So that is uh, that is great. So we could bring it into the realm of of uh, of statistics or some likelihood. So we're no longer bound by de by deterministic uh, deterministic description of the boulder uh, dislodgement process. So now, if you compare boulders moved by by storms, the classical storm amplitudes and periods, and those moved by uh, tsunamis with classical wave uh, characteristic of tsunamis, and then you can uh, uh, then you can divide the amplitudes with each other uh, by each other, and you see this plot. So this is and this is really discouraging. Why is this why is this discouraging? Because it's the it's the uh, it's the ratio between two amplitudes to move the same boulder, and we see that the maximum difference is thirty. It's it's thirty six percent or so. And my feeling is. That might not be enough, because given all the uncertainties that we have in the field, not knowing where the boulder came from, not knowing how large the, the roughness was the boulder had to go over, uh, not knowing how, uh, how far the boulder moved. If that was his original size, did it break up during the process, it might not be enough to actually say that this is a, a difference that we can actually work with. So we will we'll be looking at other ways to uh, uh, to see uh, if we actually can discriminate between boulders moved by uh, tsunamis and storms. But uh, my hopes are not rising at this stage. So now we're going to talk about uh, sand in the last seven minutes. It's going to be a real roller coaster ride. So this is uh, what I call this is what I call the honeymoon. Experience. Uh, those of you who know my wife, uh, this will not come to your surprise, but this is what we did at our honeymoon. We were shipping down the Nile. Others enjoyed their, their drink, and we worked out these equations, which are very similar to Tom Sue's equations sitting over there. Uh, but anyway, that uh, was very actually very romantic, I thought. But that's obviously an equation that we cannot solve in a context of a stochastic system because of that is way too expensive. I mean, you can't. In, in, a, in a sense of an inversion, you know, because you want to retrieve information from the deposits. We also uh, ventured out, and, and this is uh, thanks to my student who sits back there, um, we developed a model called Strike that then eventually will, will replace, uh, hopefully replace uh, the, uh, uh, the forward model that we have in our inversion system um, uh, in the future. And here's a comparison to your Johnson's data who sits somewhere over there too. Uh, and it looks really good, actually, but and, uh, but it's super, super different. It's, it's, it's just way too expensive still to put it into a context of an inversion system. And an inversion system uh, consists of model data, a forward model, and an inversion technique. And oftentimes, our inversion technique is nothing else than try and error and some other data. I will actually tell you, if I get to it, uh, to show you a real inversion. So for tsunami deposits, what we usually assume is that we have a, a, an, average, uh, an equilibrium profile, and we know that uh, from since the 30s or so that uh, larger deposit, uh, larger grain size are, are closer to the to the bed than than, than smaller ones. It's a very simple um, situation, it's physically very intuitive, and can be described by the Rouse profile by the Rouse equation. If you do that, or if you assume that that you can, uh, then you can. Uh, um, then you find that you have a normally graded deposit. Larger deposits are at the floor because they are uh, at, the, at the base because they're closer to the bed uh, than other ones. So if you then take the same approach and you know the result, you can then place the respective deposit uh, grain sizes in the water column to a position that would allow to create a certain uh, no, uh, grading 
may that be normal or, or inverse grading in the deposit uh, just by settling out. And that's essentially the forward model. And we do that by simply try and error. We try one, settle out, doesn't fit, try another one. Obviously, that's um, a little more quanti uh, quantitative than that. If we do that and, we, and we've done that to several deposits, uh, this is for the for deposits in, uh, in India from the Indian Ocean Tsunami, and we see it's actually kind of good what comes out. So, but we cannot really uh, tell anything more than uh, uh, this. So this is the inverted uh, flow speed, and they are kind of confirmed by measurements. We can give a minimum and a maximum, sort of an average, but this minimum and ax maximum is not actually in the traditional statistical sense, because there is no distribution or anything involved. It's just, uh, it's just bound by these values, physically informed. And we, in, we applied these also to, uh, to uh, storm deposits, and you can see here that we have to cut out uh, uh, some portions of the grain size because simply we cannot deal with it. Uh, so this is for uh, a high-end, I believe, in 2013. It does a reasonable job. So we are very convinced that this model can apply to certain situations uh, for storms as well, and we can even extrapolate. But now we want to talk about real, real inversions where you actually have a data-informed uh, inversion technique. And that's where we implemented, again, also thanks to Hui and his uh, friend, uh, to implement uh, the uh, ensemble, uh, ensemble common filter uh, ring technique uh, in CAD. And that's uh, what we've done now. But again, you need a lot more from the deposits in order to inform this technique uh, uh, because you have a time dependent uh, sort of uh, situation in there. And ENKF is often used in weather forecast, and you notice that weather forecast becomes a lot more accurate in hindsight as we come closer to a certain date, and, and so it's the same here. And we use the uh, um, sedimentation flux, I believe, in that technique as a, as a way of informing this um, inversion. And I don't want to uh, go too long for this, but this is um, my last slide. And what this allows us is I could have shown like 35 slides on how cool this is, but the real cool thing is that we can now ask, actually look at the error. We can uh, assume if you if we take artificial data we can put an error model on this data we can study the different impacts of the errors on the on the, on the result obviously we have model errors that we also can control if you do an error analysis it is i can tell you that rubbish in rubbish out is a pretty good assumption it's a pretty good model because of if you have a really accurate data and your model is is not good your your results will be not good I mean, it's not come, doesn't come to the surprise, right? And it's the same the other way around. You know, if you have a, uh, I don't even remember what I just said, but the opposite. <laughs> so, so, but what also was fascinating, what I found fascinating, so, so what you see here is the sample frequency. That's a tsunami deposit, and you take different, a different number of samples from the base to the top. So we start out with five and end up with 30. So now if you talk to field uh, uh, people, uh, they will tell you that uh, any number of, uh, be, uh, after 15 is sort of insane. At least I've been told I'm insane if I when I propose to have a large number, uh, because it's, I guess, very difficult to do that. Uh, but what this plot shows you is that the error in the, in the, uh, in the inversion sort of uh, has a sweet spot in the number of samples. So if, if you would take on the left side, uh, um, if you would take, uh, let's say, 11 samples, the error, the overall error of the inversion would be minimized. And the other one is, I, I believe, nine, and I think it's for the left one is for inversion of the flow depth, and the right one is for the inversion of the flow speed. So we can, so that's good. Now we can say, okay, we now have a proof that if you, if you take 12 samples or nine samples or some number of samples that's larger than five, it's smaller than 15 because of then the error in sampling technique it, it takes over. You actually minimize the error. And that shows that we can actually inform field work. And that's, I think, you, uh, probably one of the most important outcomes of this, of this model. Uh, and I think I have last slide, some final thoughts. We obviously need better models, but that's always true. Uh, we also need better data, uh, especially for data that comes from deposits that are not directly measured but inverted, we need to think about carefully 
how these deposits are analyzed, how the model is analyzed, so that we can actually compare apples and apples. You know, it doesn't matter if you have, uh, if you take a deposit uh, and you, in the field, and you put a lot of work in taking, diff uh, taking samples from different layers, but in the model you have a, you have just a depth average uh, sort of situation. That doesn't mean anything. We need obviously a better integration of, between field work and modeling so that people who do modeling understand what the boundaries and uh, problems are in the field and vice versa, because oftentimes I feel uh, talking to, uh, to, uh, to field people that don't understand the difficulties that we often face. And then, and especially uh, when it comes to inferences from deposits, uh, we need to just make sure we understand there are uncertainties, communicate what uncertainties mean, and maybe need to move to other techniques that allow us to uh, uh, to study those uncertainties in a more in a more sophisticated way. And with that, I uh, I leave you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert, for a thought-provoking uh, talk. Um, we're starting to run a little over schedule, but we'll take one question. I see Katie there in the back. Thank you for a lovely talk. Um, so an, I think a challenge in bringing data, field data, what have you, into the sort of inversion framework is that Really what you want is to have some sort of prior distribution on that data. If you're collecting a tsunami deposit, um, how, as a, as a model or a field practitioner, how you actually think about assigning a prior, that kind of data is really challenging. And so I wanted to see if you had any insight from your work on thinking about how you put the kinds of mathematical descriptions onto the kinds of data that you need to use in this um, model data comparison framework? I would like to have just reliable data that tells me at which, which height above the, above the base of the deposit, what grain size was in a very robust, statistically robust way would be awesome. I'm not asking for trying to, for priors or whatever in a statistical sense to see but there's so many uncertainties associated with the modeling that we have to be very brave in our definition of distributions of certain parameters anyway, uh, but just very reliable and standardized data because of uh, tsunami deposits can be this thick or this thick and they are generated by the same, by the same tsunami five meters apart. So, I mean, they are, so, uh, it's, it's like a standard way that allows me to, to look at the robustness of the data that is, in, that is measured, you know, or, or the procedure. Because what we did in our modeling is oftentimes we, we try to create a situation where we can sample the model deposits in the same way as the, uh, as the field deposits, but we don't have to deal with the dirt and number of grains because we have pretty much, uh, we can just shove it in there, right? And, and statistically, but they have a, in the field, you, you collect a, a finite amount of grain that at some point impacts your, your stuff. And, and then just the standardization of that would be enough. And not even sort of thinking of in a more advanced uh, way. And also make people understand who collect this data that it's actually important to be precise and accurate and not just shove it in the back. Thank you. No offense to any field person. <laughs> Thank you, Robert.